So Claris is a new tool in our box that works with and complements existing Anaplan functionality. First, before we get into it, a quick intro of our Axolytics team. I'm Chris Laudit, and with me here today are our supply chain subject matter experts, Matt Russell and Michael Levitt. Last week in our webinar, we talked about supply chain resiliency and how companies are managing risks. This week, we're going to go a bit more technical, and we'll discuss utilizing Anaplan Polaris to handle sparse supply chain data sets. I'm going to review the basics, then Matt and, and Michael will go into some more details uh, and do a little bit of a deeper dive. So let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so what is Polaris? So Anaplan Polaris it basically expands the hyperblock family of calculation engines to natively store and calculate highly sparse data sets. Sparsity develops in the standard Anaplan hyperblock hyper engine as we add dimensionality to our models. Adding dimensionality enables powerful insights to be made into a company's data, but there's a limit to how much dimensionality can be added. At some point, and especially with supply chain use cases, a trade-off needs to be made. You may not be able to match the natural hierarchies of business, and you may need to settle for a limited hierarchy that does not perfectly match the business's needs. Polaris was designed specifically for these situations. So as it eliminates the need to store empty data points, Polaris empowers you to model and analyze your business at the natural dimensionality and granularity at scale and to offer rich, actionable insights to drive faster business outcomes by intuitively slicing and dicing through every facet of the business with overall reduced costs. So here are some examples of why we often run out of space when modeling real world business situations. You can see like, for example, on the sales example, you might have a use case where you're You've got 300 or more salespeople, many thousands of customers. In fact, most CPG companies that sell to supermarkets and, 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 and retailers in the United States have thousands of customers, and they also may have more than one way they look at a customer hierarchy because of the complexity of distributors. And each of these hierarchies may end up meeting many levels. So when you look at the supply chain example, when you're talking about figuring out, for example, exploding a bill of materials, um, you may have lots of products with lots of components with lots of levels, and that can get sparse pretty quickly. So we do run into this with supply chain, chain a lot. So Polaris uses a completely new underlying engine, which is a natively sparse engine. That means that the amount of memory workspace used by a line item does not depend on the dimensionality. Rather, it depends on the number of populated or non-zero cells. So if I create a 10 billion cell line item in Polaris that is all zeros, it will require zero bytes of workspace. Uh, note, though, that, that every populated non-zero cell in Polaris requires more memory workspace, about 24 bytes, than every cell in the classic engine, which is about eight bytes. So there's a trade-off, but um, when there are highly sp sparse data sets, you can quickly see that Polaris is going to gain you back a lot of space really quickly and make for a much more efficient deployment. So workspace size for a Polaris model is driven by the number of populated cells only, including primary, aggregate, and calculated cells, and not the dimensionality. That's the key differentiator. So now, as a solution architect for Anaplan, I now have another tool that can be utilized in situations that we regularly face, and it's going to make us much more versatile for our, for our, our clients and customers. I want to pass over to um, uh, Matt and then Mike Cook, so we can go over some more details. I think they've done a little deeper dive. You know, projecting in a plan space, you know, I, wa I want to call out at the beginning because we're talking about space and it can be a sensitive topic that, you know, on all the projects that I've worked on, we haven't had to go back to Anaplan and ask more space. We've always been able to work the solution in. So even though we think this is exciting and adds functionality to the supply chain, it doesn't mean that we think what's out there now isn't good. We just think that this is a little bit better in supply chain cases. Um, and estimating space for a module is far easier than projecting it for the final workspace. Um, as Chris said, the average cell is eight bytes. I think text is 10. Um, so if we have a list of 12 members, list one with 12 members, list two with 12 members, and one line item formatted uh, as a number is eight bytes, the model will consume 1,152 bytes, which we all agree is not a whole lot of bytes. But in the supply chain space, numbers get big in a fast way. First, I do want to call out at the top of this slide, Kamal and Brandon have a model optimization 
uh, webinar that they have, and it's available out on YouTube. Certainly uh, encourage you to go out and see that. But they talk about how Axolytics works around those problems in the classic Anaplan workspace. But to give you an idea of the just a very straightforward story as a customer, as a planner, I want a module to display current year and two years of history in weekly buckets. I would like to have this dimensionalized by customer and product. Right, it sounds a lot like the very beginning of every demand planning system we talk about. Let's put take customer and product, right? So our client, this is a CPG. So they have a lot of doors. They've got 10,000 doors. They've got 10,000 SKUs. So we begin multiplying. We go 10,000 customers times 10,000 SKUs times 156 weekly buckets, right? That's three years. Uh, times the eight bytes, and we're at 124 billion bytes or 124 gigabytes of space for every line item in that module. That's not sustainable. In non-hyperblock, most of your workspaces are capped out at 130 gigs. Now you're talking about a single history line and delta to prior year would be 250 gigabytes of space. When we know from history, not every customer takes every SKU. We know there's not always natural sparsity that exists in there, but we always have to find a way to work around it. And it generates the need for user filters and different ways for you to slice and dice your data. The nice thing is be able to put everything up in dimensionalized at the top of your UX page and just be able to move up and down any hierarchy that you use in your business. I like the way that you explained that. It makes a lot of sense. I think bottom line, ultimately, the result is, is that we're making trade-offs when we're doing the design. Um, as you mentioned, the common brand and showed how they, they have workarounds, but uh, event, ultimately we're not able to match the native natural hierarchies within a business all the time. We might have to eliminate a level or, or reduce the, the size of the, of the list at a, to a higher level of, of aggregation or whatever. Um, and so you're just a little bit limited. And so, you know, this Polaris gives us the opportunity now to say, okay, we don't have to, make those design decisions anymore. We can we can model companies' business as it exists in the real world. Kind of brainstormed real quick where it naturally presents itself. Customer and product history is already displayed. Distribution center and products. Not every distribution center is going to carry every product. Funnily enough, any function that requires disaggregation, i.e. A geographical item forecast to DC SKU requirements, those require a deep level of modeling knowledge to be able to skinny up to get through the 130 gigabyte normal workspace and have a usual size because I can't dimensionalize something by geography, product, SKU, and DC. So we end up having to do three or four steps for for disaggregation and what should be able to be done in one. Vendor and products is another one. Financial organization and customer. So if you're sitting at the top of a company that has a lot of different operating companies beneath it um, that can generate problems when you when you begin to roll up the data. So this is just really like five, 10 minutes of where have I had conversations about sparsity with our customers in the past and where does Polaris make those conversations no longer necessary? And, it, and it's a lot of supply chain applications. Yeah, I mean, real, real world example and, and your, your space example is a good example but we had a client, uh, a manufacturing company that had a customer list, a uh, product list, and a uh, basically a, a production list, how, how it got manufactured. And they wanted a, a very large module with numerous line items with all three dimensions. And when we tried to add all three dimensions into the module, it, it Anaplan refused to accept it because their model size would have been six terabytes. So it can go way past gigabytes and jump up into the terabyte territory quick, very quickly. Yeah, with real world data. Mm -hmm. Yes, all very valid points that, that Matt has brought up. And, and one thing, there are several things that you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with Polaris. One, Polaris is not a model, it is a workspace. So if you decide to use Polaris, you will have two separate workspaces. You'll have the standard Anaplan workspace for the original Anaplan models, and you'll have a Polaris workspace that'll only contain Polaris models. One thing you need to be aware of in calculations of Polaris is it, it only calculates when it sees data that is 
a non-zero or if it's a text field or something like that. But when you calculate, if you have calculations, if you have a single source, let's say it's 612 bytes, that single source goes to one other source, that's another 612 bytes. However, if you have a one-to-many, you can exponentially increase your calculation times because now instead of Polaris only calculating one cell, it has to calculate every reference of that cell further downstream. So you want to be very careful and you kind of want to build Polaris to be one-to-one -one calculations. Another good thing about Polaris and lack of, and, and the way it addresses sparsity is a lot of calculation modules in Polaris are built off of flat lists. So instead of using, say, your P3 list for your product, you would create a P3 flat, run your calculations on that, and then pull that data into your hierarchical views, which are not running your calculations. And this, again, cuts down your calculations times and the size of the model itself. So those are two things or a few things you want to be aware of. Now, one of the good things about Polaris is it does have a built-in zero of uh, suppress zero feature. So an end user can very easily suppress zeros on a large grid where there's a lot of sparse data that they don't want to see and only see the line items that contain data for the time frame that they're looking at. One of the other very interesting and, and nice things about Polaris is that you really don't have to create time ranges, nor do you have to create or, or update your model time settings. Polaris has a built-in feature, which is triggered by a Boolean, where if you had five years of data, or, or let's say you had two prior years, one current year, and three future years, and you, you progress forward, you can actually turn the calculation off for that, that very past or the very last year of history. So you don't have to make adjustments to your model calendar. You can keep the data in the model and you can just turn off the calculation feature so that it doesn't recalculate because if it's say 2019, that data should not change. So there is no need for the system to continuously go back and try to recalculate 2019 because that is a locked historical year. And you can just tell Polaris, don't calculate this year anymore. So it does help a little bit on the back end maintenance and management of the Anaplan model for the customer because there's less they have to do tweaking their model calendar or setting up time ranges to reduce space. They can just easily go in, click a bully, and it says, don't calculate this year and move on. One other thing is calculation complexity we kind of addressed in, in the fan out. Uh, are, I think are two very critical topics that you want to keep in mind with Polaris that you don't build chain calculations. Try to have a single source calculation and then per Anaplan reference, you know, calculate once reference numerous times, but don't calculate based off of calculations. That That is a very big no-no with the Polaris system. Um, and I think that's about all the bullet points that I had for things to be aware of or things that, you know, could ease the uh, model admin's job. Okay, and just to augment uh, something on uh, uh, what you said, um, when you have the workspaces working together side by side, maybe you've got a hyperblock normal workspace and then a Polaris, you can still architect everything to work together. So if you've got existing supply chain like SNOP or Data Hub in hyperblock and you wanna add a model in the other workspace with your Polaris, you can still import data back and forth and, and architect that into the, the, the overall solution, just like you can with any connected planning solution of Anaplan today. So there's no loss of functionality there. Absolutely. And, uh, and if you were going to say, say our P3 example, if we wanted to create a flat P3 list, um, obviously we would mirror our hierarchical P3 list and utilizing the same codes makes it easy to transfer data back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, okay, so I guess, I think that's it. I think that was a, you know, a brief um, deep dive into the Anaplan Polaris. And we hope you got a lot out of this and that you guys will be um, eager to deploy and to improve your customer's experience with these new opportunities that we have uh, with the new tool sets from Anaplan. Um, please uh, feel free to take a look at our, our YouTube channel. We've been posting a lot of videos um, and webinars from multiple teams within Axolytics over the, over the summer. We've got a lot of fresh new content that you might be interested in seeing. 
um, feel free to post a, uh, a comment as well if you want us to focus on anything in particular in the future.